My message today is another in our Red Letter series. This one is called Till Death Do Us Part. Now, I know you've heard me say this before, but my preaching teacher back in the day, Earl Ziegler, once said, never start off a message with a disclaimer. So once again, I owe him an apology. You see, part of this series and part of what makes this series so exciting for me personally is the fact that I need to keep working through passages, even passages that aren't always quite clear to me, and this is one of those. The truth of the matter is I don't fully understand this passage, although after my study to prepare this message, I do understand it better. But I don't know if I'll ever understand it completely on this side of the grave. It's a question, though, that I have been asked, and one that comes up in my own mind, and it starts off with this very simple question, what happens to our marriages when we die? And from there it goes much further. After all, our marriage vows say, till death do us part. And I wonder how many people stand before the altar and don't think about what that means when they say it. In our text, Jesus answers the question. But sometimes it feels like his answer brings up more questions. Look at Matthew 22. We're going to start with verse 23. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children... He left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third, right down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Now, to start off, we need to realize this first verse of the passage makes me question the motivation of those, the Sadducees specifically, who's asking the question. Maybe it's just me, because it directly follows last week's passage, but this question almost seems like a trap for Jesus. It almost seems that since the Pharisees didn't succeed in getting to Jesus in last week's passage, the, Th the Sadducees decided it was their turn. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were both part of the ruling body of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. But they had very different beliefs on key doctrines of the faith. Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead and in afterlife. The Sadducees did not. The Pharisees believed in a realm of the spirit and of angels. The Sadducees did not. They did not have a lot of com in common. And it feels like they were always trying to sort of one-up each other. These two groups almost didn't seem to like each other very much. Again, it's almost like trying to get Democrats and Republicans to agree on something. The only thing that could get these two groups working together would be if they were opposing something that, or someone that they both hated. And so it was with Jesus. The Sadducees asked a question about who is married to this woman in the resurrection. What makes this question problematic is the fact that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And when a person asks a question about something they don't believe in, sometimes it feels more like they're trying to discredit the person they're talking to than they're asking for the purpose of learning. Now that being said, does this mean if you're confronted with a question like this, you shouldn't answer it? No. Sometimes the Spirit will work on someone like this, and they will believe. And sometimes something altogether different is happening. And we'll see that here in a few minutes. What it does mean is, you need to be ready to stand your ground. You need to be confident in what it is that you believe. Jesus was about to show us how to do that. But first, let's look at this question. Teacher, 
They said in verse 24, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, this is true. The technical name for this, this practice, this law, is leveret marriage. Now, this is hard for us to wrap our heads around here in the 21st century. And part of that is because we live in a much different time. First of all, it sort of seems to imply that men were allowed and even supposed to have multiple wives according to the law, at least in certain cases. Now, before we go any further, am I advocating that? No. First of all, it's against the law of the land. But second of all, God's design for marriage is one man and one woman for life. This could also be seen as pretty sexist to our modern minds. What if the woman doesn't want to marry her brother-in-law? In actuality, there were a couple things involved here. First of all, it was about family lines and land. The idea was the dead brother's family line would continue. The land that they had would stay in the family. Remember, once again, the Israelites didn't really buy or sell their land. It was more like a lease. If you were to come to the place where you needed to sell your land, the price that you would get was based on how many years it was until what they called the year of Jubilee, which was the 50th year. Because every 50th year, the land was restored to the original owner or owning family. God was keeping family lines going in this process. He was ensuring the people were provided for and that all the people would have a portion of the land of Israel. Leverant marriage was also a way to take care of the women. Keep in mind, women didn't have a lot of options in these days. A married woman was cared for by her husband. And when he died, the children would take over responsibility. A, the brother of the deceased man would marry his sister-in-law and be responsible to meet her needs as well, meaning she would be taken care of. Yes, it was a different world. Yes, it was a different culture. But what we see here is God making sure that his daughters would be taken care of. From here, the Sadducee goes into a hypothetical question. In other words, a made-up question trying to make a point. He makes up a family of seven sons. The first son marries a woman and dies. The second son marries her. And on and on until all seven brothers marry her and all seven die childless, then she dies. Now, my first question is, who wrote this question, Stephen King? What kind of mind comes up with that scenario? How messed up would this guy have to be? I mean, there would be an investigation if this was a true story by at least Brother Three. This might be one of the most pessimistic questions Jesus was ever asked. In verse 20, it says, Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Now, before we want to jump in and try and answer this question, we need to figure something else out. Is this question about leveret marriage or is the question really about the resurrection? Seeing as how the first verse of the passage makes a point of telling us that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, the point of the question is pretty clear. The Sadducees, who again did not believe in the resurrection, sure seem to be asking a question that goes to extremes to make the idea of the resurrection of the dead look ridiculous. The question feels a lot like a trap. The Sadducee was trying to get Jesus to trip himself up with his words and prove his own belief to be ridiculous. The Sadducee, though, has no idea who he's dealing with. He was trying to argue a fine point of the law, and he was arguing with the one who was in the process of fulfilling the law in the first place. Jesus answers the question. 
And when he answers, he answers with a statement that, at least for me, begs more questions. Jesus replied, verse 29, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. The first time I read this, especially verse 30, there were so many questions. See, I love my wife. She is the one that God used to lead me to himself. I will be in heaven, at least in part, because of how God used her in my life. I don't just want to be married to her in this life. And so at first glance, I found this passage almost disappointing. I'm married here, but I won't be married there. I'll be like the angels. What does that even mean? And I want to say all kinds of things here to talk about what this means. But I'm hesitant because is that what it really means? Or is it just what I want it to mean? As I think about it more, I know it has to be right. First of all, because it's in the Bible and Jesus said it. I trust him to be right in all things. But second of all, if this were not the case, it would be wrong for the surviving spouse to remarry. Look, if I were to pass away early, I wouldn't want Dawn to be alone for the next 20 or 30 years. Now, she might say she really doesn't want to train another husband, and that's her prerogative, that's up to her. But think about it. Our vows say, till death do us part. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Those last words, only in the Lord, those are important. This means we need to be sure that if we do remarry after we lose a spouse, that we marry people who are believers. People who will not lead us astray. But we're neither commanded to nor forbidden from remarrying. And to do so after the loss of a spouse is not adultery or infidelity. It makes sense that God would not want his heaven full of jealous spouses or that the earth would be full of people who were desperately lonely. And I think that brings us back to verse 29. Look what Jesus calls out. Speaking to this Sadducee, Jesus says, you are in error because you don't know the scriptures. Now, I think that applies more to the part about the resurrection, and we'll get to that. But he also told them, they don't know the power of God. And I think that part applies to this discussion. Think about heaven. To me, it's one of the hardest things of the faith to comprehend. Oh, don't get me wrong. I believe and I know there is a heaven. Jesus said so, and I believe it. But the part about heaven that is hard to understand is it's hard to conceive of a perfect place. And it's hard to understand what it will be like when we are made perfect once and for all. We have never lived in a world that was not racked by the effects of sin. I find, as I've said before, that every time I think of heaven, it's only a matter of time until I catch myself and remind myself that what I'm imagining won't be there because it's an effect of sin, and sin won't be present in heaven. When you have time, when you spent your whole time, excuse me, your whole life, surrounded by sin and its effects, it's hard to imagine what a place without it, without sin and its effects, will be like. When Jesus says, you don't know the power of God, what he's saying is, we don't understand that God can make a wonderful world that is greater than anything we can imagine. This passage seems to say that marriage doesn't continue in heaven as we now understand it. And I have to admit, that concerns me because I deeply love my wife. But here's the thing. Do you believe that heaven is going to be better than earth? Yes, right? Do you believe that God is capable of doing all good things? Yes, right? 
Do you believe that in heaven we will all be made perfect? Yes, right? Do you, or did you, love your spouse perfectly? I can't speak for you. But my answer to that question is no. Not because I don't want to, but because I'm limited and imperfect and so is she. We love each other deeply, but not perfectly. Because in this life, we're imperfect. So what is heaven going to be like? I don't know. And what are our relationships with our spouses and others going to be like in heaven? I don't know that either. But I know it's going to be better than it is here. And I know that my wife and I have weathered a lot of storms in this world. But that we're headed to a place where there are no more storms. Surely we will know our loved ones in heaven. We see evidence of this in the scriptures. For example, at the Transfiguration, the very much alive disciples recognized Moses and Elijah, two people they had never seen before, who had died over a thousand years before they were born. Matthew 18, 11 also tells us, I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Meaning we will have identities in heaven and we will know each other in heaven. And we will surely know those that we have loved in this life. So what makes us think, if all that is true, and it is, that our relationships with those we have loved in this broken world will somehow be lesser in a place where everything is better and greater, where we are all made perfect. I don't think it will be. I don't think it can be. We will have within us the ability to relate to each other perfectly. I believe what Jesus said here is true, first of all, because he's Jesus and he knows all things, but I also trust that the place he has prepared for us, the one who loves us most and knows us best, will make everything better than it is here and better forever. Remember what the Bible says about heaven. Revelation 21, 4. He, that's God himself, will wipe away every tear from their eyes and, there, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Folks, in Christ, that's where we're headed. And in a place like that, living in the very presence of God, things cannot help but be better and stay better forever. As the ESV Study Bible says, Jesus' reference to the power of God suggests that God is able to establish relationships of even deeper friendship, joy, and love in the life to come. And while God doesn't give us all the details, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 says this, But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. He is, after all, as Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. Translation, the Lord has all this worked out. For all who believe in Jesus, our eternity is secure. And while we don't know exactly how those relationships will look, this much we know. For the believer... Everything good here will be made better and perfect there. God has got this, so trust him. One other thing to consider. The Bible compares the marriage relationship to the relationship between Christ and his church. I think it's pretty clear to see that that relationship is eternal. And so we might imagine so are our marriages, at least in some redeemed form. To answer the Sadducees question, assuming these characters in the, his story all submitted their hearts to Jesus, which is the only way to eternal life, something else the Pharisees did not believe in, and something, excuse me, the Sadducees did not believe in, and something the Sadducee failed to take into consideration, probably because he wrongly assumed that he was better than Jesus. 
the hypothetical wife of the hypothetical seven brothers in the Sadducees made up hypothetical story will not be married. She will not be married to any of the seven brothers in the Sadducees made up story. Instead, they will all be made perfect and have a perfect relationship with each other that will last forever. The Sadducees made up question also proves another important point. Never try to trick Jesus. It's not possible. Now to this point, I spent a lot of time talking about marriage and eternity. I doubt that the Sadducee who believed in neither the resurrection nor eternal life asked a question that had anything at all to do with marriage. Rather, I think he was trying to back Jesus into a corner. I think he was trying to have him run afoul of the Pharisees by saying something that would have conflicted with their beliefs on resurrection and eternal life. Or possibly, he wanted to prove himself smarter than Jesus. Can I tell you he failed at both of those things? What the question was really about was the resurrection. I believe this is why Jesus said, you are in error because you don't know the scriptures. The fact that they didn't believe in heaven means they didn't believe the scriptures. They didn't know the scriptures. Now again, Jesus is ushering in the New Testament at this part of the Bible. But they're still living in an old covenant world. Are there a ton of references to eternal life in the Old Testament? Not really. But there are a few. For example, Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Or Psalm 139, 23 and 24, which says, Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. These are just two of many references from the Old Testament that deal with eternal life. These and many others were right there to show a life beyond this world. The ones they would have been called heroes of the faith made it to heaven. But these folks, these Sadducees, even though the evidence was all over Scripture, chose to believe something different. With all their education and all their training, they chose to overlook passages that point to the blessed hope in eternal life. To take the attitude of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Worse, they held positions of spiritual authority over God's chosen people while failing to believe an important aspect of the faith. Jesus clarifies it here for them in verse 31. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? And here Jesus quotes a verse from when God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. See, this is God speaking of people who had been dead at least 400 years and some over a thousand at the time Moses wrote it down. But notice this. When God spoke to Moses, he listed these patriarchs of the faith in the present tense. And the reason for that is simple. God is the God of the living and not the dead. This means that those who have passed on before living in faith in our Lord and the promise of the coming, coming Savior, are not dead. Those who have come to Christ by faith since the resurrection are not dead. They are very much alive and they are in eternity. Folks, this is our hope. There is a life beyond this life for all believers. And just like the Sadducees, there are a multitude of people in our world today who believe that the idea of eternal life and resurrection is foolishness. They might even ask you questions designed to derail your faith. Love them and pray for them because as it stands at this moment, if that is their attitude, people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ walk through this world completely without hope. 
To them, we need to follow the admonition, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have, the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And that brings us to the final verse of this passage and another point. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Do you see what happened here? Jesus answered an unbelieving Sadducee. Was the Sadducee convinced? I have no idea. The Bible never says. But it's clear he wasn't the only one there. It mentions the crowds. And the other people, it says, came away astonished. And that's just it. When we share about Jesus, we never know who's listening. And you and I and all believers always represent Christ. Jesus was ready. And I don't know if the Sadducee was reached or if he walked away as convinced as ever that he was right. But someone was listening. Maybe someone who had experienced the loss and now has a greater understanding or a greater hope. And maybe, just maybe, there was someone there who started to consider that there's something more. What if this life is more than just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? What if they came away wanting to know more about the resurrection and eternal life? These are things we don't know when we speak to others. Maybe the marriage vow statement has a deeper meaning. We're all together in this world, believers and unbelievers, trying to negotiate life in a fallen world. But there will come a time when our time in this world will be over. And in that moment, those who are in Christ will go to spend eternity with our Lord and with the saints who have gone before. This is when we will see our believing loved ones again, in whatever way that relationship will look. I don't know how it will look, but I know this, it will be good. And while we may not completely understand all that is involved right now, we know God has it under control, and it will be exactly as he promised. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Those who pass on without Christ will go into eternity too. But it will be a different eternity. An eternity separated from God. All people will stand before the same Lord. And at that point, some will go to heaven, some will go to hell. Believers and unbelievers might be in this world all together now, but till death do his part. Amen.